A VOR is an upgraded version of the NDBs we looked at in the previous class. But what makes these types of beacons so much better? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the fifth class in the radio navigation series. Today we're going to be having a look at very high frequency omnidirectional range beacons or VORs for short. We're going to have a look at how they work and in what ways they are different and better to your standard basic NDBs. A VOR, which stands for a very high frequency omnidirectional range beacon, is a type of short range radio navigation system used by aircraft and even though it has range in the title, it provides no range or distance information. It transmits a signal in all directions on the VHF band between 30 and 300 megahertz, and more specifically between 108 and 117.95 megahertz. That's what onboard receivers can interpret to determine the aircraft's position and direction relative to the beacon. They share some of this bandwidth, this frequency range, with more precise beacons called instrument landing systems used specifically at airports for landing, so it is important that we identify the beacon we are using to ensure the safe and correct usage of them. There are two types of VOR out there in the world that are called standard and Doppler, and we're first going to take a look at the standard type. A standard VOR system relies on two signals transmitted from a ground station. The first is a stationary reference signal, this signal is constantly emitted in all directions and serves as a baseline for comparison. This signal is sent out omnidirectionally at a 30 hertz frequency, so it's 30 times per second, but the actual frequency of the signal is between that uh, 108 to 117.95 megahertz range. So it's pulsing 30 times per second like this. The second type of signal is a rotating variable signal this signal sweeps around 360 degrees like a lighthouse, but it does it electronically, and it also rotates at 30 times per second. But this signal is amplitude modulated, whereas the previous one was frequency modulated. The rotating AM signal is set up in such a way that, it spin, that as it spins, it sort of creeps out of phase, and it does so by 90 degrees at east, 180 degrees at south, 270 degrees at west and then it's back in phase um, by zero and it does this proportionally by one degree of phase per degree of angle. This phase difference between the spinning AM signal and the stationary reference FM signal is what the aircraft actually detects and then we have 360 distinct sort of separate signals that we can tune into. Think of it like the spokes on a bike um, of your uh, of the wheel of your bike, sorry. We can select which one we want to choose and follow it precisely. This means that it is better than an NDB as we can sort of lock into a specific radio coming off of the VOR. A Doppler VOR provides the same sort of spokes on a wheel type information, but it achieves it in a different way. An FM signal is sent out by a circular array of antennas. Each antenna switches on and off quickly and it rotates around the VOR. Each signal sends out the uh, frequency omnidirectionally, and this means that from our perspective in the aircraft, the signal is constantly moving towards us, then away from us as it passes around the circle, and this creates a Doppler shift, which is an apparent change in frequency as a signal moves either away or towards us. If we compare this signal, um, this moving signal, sorry, to a reference signal, which this time is going to be an AM signal, then the difference can be detected as a frequency difference in those signals, which is going to be distinct for every degree around our compass rows. We can then use our aircraft to our aircraft equipment to detect this frequency difference, set the course we want to follow, and follow that spoke on the wheel of the bike precisely. In the aircraft, you won't notice any difference between a standard VOR or a Doppler VOR. There are just two ways of achieving the same goal and your aircraft will know the difference and pick up on whichever type of signal is coming in and display it for you in a nice standard way regardless of how the signal is produced if it's a Doppler or a standard VOR. And as with NDBs it's important to identify your VORs to ensure our equipment is tuned correctly and we don't just have a control panel that's displaying the correct thing 
without the antennas changing and tuning in correctly. This ident is sent out as a separate signal, modulated slightly differently at 1020 Hz as a three-letter identifier in Morse code. This signal uh, repeats every 10 seconds, and you'll have to listen to it, or on a modern display, it might decipher this signal and show the three-letter uh, identifier on a, a little screen, for example. So by tuning up our VOR, we're going to get three signals back, basically. We're going to get an AM signal, an FM signal, and this separate identification signal. So once we have the signal in our aircraft, we want to display it in one of three primary ways. The most basic way of displaying VOR information is using a radio magnetic indicator, or an RMI, and you use it in much the same way you do as an NDB. It's a basic form of using a VOR and essentially serves as an arrow pointing towards the VOR, which doesn't use all of that useful bearing radial spokes on the wheel information that's actually sent out by the VOR. So your radio magnetic indicator in the aircraft might look something like this. You have two little sort of toggle switches. So your radio panel will be tuned to one frequency. Your second radio panel will be tuned to another frequency. And if you want to switch to the ADF, you would flick this little toggle switch and then this arrow would then represent the uh, ADF, or if you switch it to the VOR, it's going to represent the VOR. So in this example, they're both selected to VORs, so these are pointing at different things, meaning we'd have two separate VORs tuned, one over here and one over in this direction. A more useful way of displaying the VOR information, actually using that spokes on the wheel, all that bearing information that's being sent out, is by using something called an Omni Bearing Indicator, an OBI. Basically what they are is they are a compass rose with a dial down here to select which bearing you want to follow along. And it has something called a course deviation indicator, which is this needle here, as well as a to and from flag. And some will also indicate like a no signal slash failure indicator it might pop up in the bottom right corner, for example. In this example, we're looking down here. We've tuned up our VOR and we've identified it as Tango India Tango, which is over here. And we're flying on the QDM of 040 to the Tango India Tango, which means we're on the 220 radial of the VOR. And that's indicated up top. We are flying on the 040, we've selected it, and we're flying to it. And our course deviation indicator is showing we're precisely on the line. We're flying along that bike spoke towards the central hub, which is the VOR. It's also important to note that when we're following VOR radials, you're on a great circle track. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, check out general navigation videos. You're basically following uh, a line that is the shortest possible route to that VOR. But because VORs are used over relatively short ranges, it doesn't really matter if it's a great circle or if it's just a straight line like a rum line, for example. Say in this example, we were following our 040 radial, uh, 040 track towards our VOR, then we start to drift off to the left. Our plane starts to fly off to the left. What's gonna happen here is our course deviation indicator is gonna show us our course deviation. And this needle will deflect to the right if the way we need to fly is right, and to the left if the way we need to fly is left when we're flying towards the VOR. So, for example, if it was deflected by a couple of dots, each dot in this example represents two degrees. The maximum course deviation is always 10. So there's five dots there, each one of them is gonna be two. So say it was two dots off, that means we're four degrees off our course. We'd maybe have to turn four degrees more in to the wind or towards the VOR to correct and fly back on our selected 040 track towards the VOR. A more advanced version of the OBI is something called a horizontal situ situation indicator, an HSI. And this is common on modern aircraft and even the big jets still have a digital version of this available to be displayed on one of the screens. The difference between this and an OBI is that with an OBI, there's no heading information fed into the uh, display here. The only time this thing actually spins is when you're selecting the course to fly. That would move this compass rose that's sort of hidden behind this front panel. 
The HSI is linked to the compass in the aircraft, so it will always show the current heading at the top, which is better for figuring out the position of our aircraft in space and flying appropriate headings to stay on the selected bearing. If we look at an example, we're looking at sort of this right hand side here now. Let's say we're flying north ish towards the 090 radial of the Tango India Tandem Go, and we want to fly towards that VOR. So basically, what we're going to do is we're going to fly a QDM of 270. So, what we've done in the example is we've selected our course to the 270 radial, but our heading is about 330. We're flying just to the northwest. As we fly closer and closer, this course deviation indicator is going to come in. So this uh, broken line part, you can see now it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, it's five dots off the center line, which means we are 10 degrees or more further away from the selected course, which is 270. And as we fly closer and closer, this line here is just gonna close and close and close. And when we're on exactly the 090 radial or the 270 course towards the VOR, then the line would all be centered straight through the middle of the aircraft and uh, perfectly in line with the tail as well. If we were to continue on the current heading, we would then see the course deviation bar deflect the other way because we're flying above our course that we've selected now. So what we want to do is we want to turn on to it and as we turn on to it, the arrow, the heading, and the heading bug will all turn together and align, and hopefully we're gonna get a nice inline arrow in line with the top of our display at 270 as the aircraft turns the corner and flies towards the VOR down here. It can be quite hard to explain with drawings. I recommend just going on watching some other YouTube videos on how an HSI indicator works. I found Omni bearing indicators very confusing and um, when I first started, but it's actually okay once you get in the aircraft or on a flight simulator or something like that. Just have a little play around. You'll start to figure it out um, what the process is and an, an instructor who's teaching you how to fly on these things will have probably some pretty cool methods for understanding how to do it. There are a few errors in the VOR system, but not so much as the NDB system which is why VORs are generally preferred. They're a bit more accurate and a bit more reliable. One of the main ones that you do get with VORs though is something called the cone of confusion. So basically the signals are sent out horizontally and they follow a line of sight path, which means they're not going directly up. And you can think of it basically as the initial up part of the signal. That's gonna be where you can no longer detect the signal. It would go out from the top part of that uh, signal, if that makes sense, that upward slope that you get initially. And what this means is basically that when you're overhead the VOR, there's no signal that can be detected. It kind of makes sense as well because what direction is up, if that makes sense? Like north isn't up, neither south, neither is east or west. So when we're above it, how can any of those directions actually exist? It's a bit confusing. And that's why it's called the cone of confusion. It doesn't make sense to get a signal when we're flying overhead. Um, what's going to happen is you might get a failure flag or the deviation bar might do all sorts of things such as flap from left to right. Your to and from flags on your OBI might flash up and down. So if you were flying towards this thing and you want to cross overhead the VOR, you might get fine, fine, fine. Deviation bar goes mad, to from signals and then settles down, goes fine, fine, fine again. Um, but it's a known thing, if you're flying overhead of VOR, you know your signal is going to temporarily uh, be degraded. Um, so it's actually not too bad as an error. The next one is something called scalloping. So the VHF waves sent out by a VOR are a high enough frequency that they're not subject to any refracting or bending like the waves from NDBR around the coast or mountains. They can, however, reflect and bounce off mountains. That means that the receiver antenna in the aircraft might receive a signal from a reflection and the true unobstructed signal at the same time. This means that the phases and that phase difference that we rely on or that frequency difference will be all wrong and can cause the deviation bar to move rapidly from side to side. And it's kind of not possible to follow these 
VOR signals and it can be quite unreliable. The third error that's probably most common is simple line of sight stuff. As VORs propagate their waves in space waves or line of sight waves, if we can't see the VOR due to a mountain or like the curvature of the Earth, then we can't use it. This means that the range of a VOR is dictated by the max theoretical range equation, which is here, 1.23 times the square root of the transceiver plus the uh, transmitter plus the square root of the receiver. That is the theoretical range. All VORs will have a stated range on them based on the power output of the beacon itself as well, which will be located in the country you're in, Aeronautical Information Publication, which is a very long and boring legal document where you can find out all this sort of stuff about which VOR has what range. And when you're within that range, the stated accuracy should be plus or minus five degrees 95% of the time. So if you're within that tolerance of accuracy, you are considered to be flying accurately and flying on track or on the correct course. And procedures at airports and airways, etc., will always be designed with this plus or minus five degree accuracy in mind. Okay, a quick summary then. So a VOR operates in the VHF band, specifically between 108 and 117.95 megahertz. The IDEN is sent out as a separate modulation from the standard two AM and FM signals. At 1020 hertz, it's three letters and it's every 10 seconds. Your VORs come in two flavors. There's a standard or a Doppler VOR. Standard, you've got a reference signal, which is FM, and a digitally rotating beam of AM signal. And the phase difference between these two signals gives out specific uh, radials that you can follow those spokes on the wheel of a bike that you can tune into and fly directly on accurately using uh, a bit of information like a bit of equipment like an OBI or an HSI. Doppler VOR achieves the same effect, but uses the Doppler shift um, to create a frequency difference. And that frequency difference is specific for each individual spoke on the wheel. And we can use that frequency difference to fly accurately along a selected bearing or a selected radial. The three ways that you can display it, RMI, OBI, HSI. RMI is just a pointing arrow. VOR is over there. Let's fly towards it. No information given with the specific bearings or radials that are available. OBI sort of upgrades this. We can select a specific radial that we want to follow and the course deviation, deviation indicator will show us how far displaced off of that uh, selected course we are. The problem with the OBI is it's static, so it doesn't give too accurate information in uh, space. It's not a very uh, easy way to understand how to follow a VOR or to follow a VOR, because you're comparing this with a heading with another display. HSI combines it all into one. You've got heading information and you've got course information in the same place. Your fl the display will spin with the heading you're at. You can select a heading that you want to fly with this little knob and this little knob. You would select the course that you want to fly. Course deviation indicator shows how far to the left or right of that course you are. And both of these displays will have maximum deflections of 10 degrees. Uh, and in these examples, I've used five dots either side to represent two degrees each. You might get some that just have two either side or one either side to represent five degrees and 10 degrees or however the maths works. Uh, but maximum deflection is always 10 degrees. And then errors we talked about quickly just before. You've got the cone of confusion. When you're overhead, if you are, it's not gonna work properly. You've got scalloping, which is the reflection of another signal into your receiver in the aircraft causing confusion and uh, interference between the two signals, which can lead to unreliable ones. And then you've also got the line of sight problems. If you can't see it, you can't use it. But if you can use it and see it and you're within the correct range, then it should be accurate to being plus or minus five degrees 95% of the time.